so far we have been talking about dyeing and its procedure, the basics of dyeing, the typical natural dyeing recipes and so on and so forth. Today's lecture is dedicated to the preparation for dyeing, preparation of the cloth, how the cloth should be prepared before it is taken for dyeing. We know that there are uh, the simplest way of preparing the cloth is to wash it, but there are certain very specific procedures that need to be followed when dyeing has to be done, be it dyeing with synthetic dyes or be it dyeing with natural dyes, one needs to prepare the cloth very effectively for a better dye uptake. Now, the methodology of preparation of uh, cloth is the following. Grey cloth as it comes from the loom stage is unattractive and contains natural as well as added impurities, which hinders the successful operations of dyeing by reducing the absorbency of the fabric. That is why it is necessary to make the fabric water absorbent by making the fabric free from any natural as well as added impurities in order to achieve successful dyeing process. So, one thing should be very, very clear that when the grey cloth is coming after the weaving of the cloth, it is to be remembered that it needs to be purified and this purification is in terms of its washing. And because that will, this washing of the waxes, of the oils, of the impurities will enhance the absorbency of the uh, fabric. We know that if the water absorbency enhances, the dye uptake automatically enhances in the case of cellulosic fiber as well as in the case of proteinaceous fiber. So, whether it is cotton or whether it is wool or silk, the first thing that one needs to do with the grey cloth, grey cloth is the raw unwashed unbleached cloth is called grey cloth. It contains lot of natural impurities and some of them are even added impurities. So, these should be removed before it is prepared for dyeing. Preparation of cotton cloth contains following steps, steps systematically. In order to you know prepare cotton which is toughest to dye, we have to take lot of precautions because unless and until the cotton is washed properly, it will not uh, uh, have good absorbency and if it does not have go good absorbency because of the waxes and the oils on the cotton surface it is going to be even tough to dye it. So, let us try to look at the procedure. Different treatments to the cotton fabric are, it needs to be desized, it needs to be scoured and it needs to be bleached finally. So, there are three main steps that cotton needs to undergo. One is desizing, the other one is scouring and the third one is bleaching. Desizing, let us try to understand what exactly is meant by desizing. Desizing is a process by which fatty matters are removed from the grey cloth such as starch which apply to the warp and weft yarn during weaving in order to withstand the stress or strain. See what happens, cotton is very tender. So, in order to you know draw it into yarns and then the yarns being um, you know woven in the warp and the weft, what happens is that this starch has to be added. If starch is not added, cotton is very soft and the yarn would break during the process of weaving. Now, in order to facilitate weaving, starch is particularly added to the yarn. The process of desizing can be done either by hydrolytic desizing or by oxidative desizing. So, desizing 
or removal of such starchy impurities is done by two methods. One is the hydrolytic method and the other one is the oxidative method. Either of them are used. It is not that both the processes are used. The theme of desizing process is only to convert insoluble starch into soluble form. So, because this insolubility will further create a non absorbency of uh, dye solution in at the later stage of dyeing, that is why it is important to remove starch. What if the starch is not removed? If starch is not removed from the fabric, it will only create more dye aggregates to settle in one place and it will affect the dye absorbency. I told you if you recall that by capillary action between the mesh there are pores, you know when the warp and the weft, these are two dimensional threads that weave the cloth, when they are woven there are small pores. Now, it is through these pores by the capillary action, the dye enters the fabric and that is what we call as dye uptake. Now, dye uptake will be hindered if starch is present because starch is in the insoluble form. So, this insoluble starch needs to be converted into the soluble form and that is the dextrin and the dextrin is then further converted into maltose and the maltose is converted into glucose. So, from one form to the other, the whole idea of this conversion from starch to glucose by the hydrolytic uh, uh, process or by the oxidative process is to convert insoluble to soluble form. Now, similarly, the next step that is uh, done to the fabric, cotton fabric particularly, but this is also true for silk and wool is the scouring step. So, only desizing is done in the case of cotton, but scouring is common to cotton and silk and wool all. Scouring is a process by which oils, fats, waxes and other nitrogenous matters are removed. The process is carried out by adding 2 gram per liter caustic soda or 1 gram per liter soda ash or 1 gram per liter TRO that is the terpene oil and then the temperature is raised to boiling and the process continued for 3 to 4 hours under the pH of 10 to 11.5. That means, under alkaline condition, the whole uh, uh, substance fabric, be it cotton, be it silk, be it wool are washed in order to remove the oils and fats and waxes. Now, TRO is a solvent and therefore, it, it, it is like petroleum oil, it is derived from petroleum ether and so it solubilizes the oils and the fats and the waxes and thus it even washes away these and the caustic soda um, acts like a washing powder to remove these. But this is a very harsh scouring method. There are milder scouring methods with milder soaps also possible particularly for silk and wool. Now, bleaching is very essential when we are dyeing, we are about to dye cotton, bleaching is a must, a method of bleaching. The fabric is rinsed, stuck against a stone so as to remove as much of the sizing as possible. It is then spread out for sun bleaching and drying. Water is sprinkled over the cloth at short intervals until evening. This is finally washed and dried. So, this is like sun bleaching, but there are now chlorine bleaches, there are hydrogen peroxide bleaching and so on and so forth. But the traditional method of bleaching is by washing it and putting it in the sun. The UV rays of the sun actually act like a bleaching agent 
and removed any kind of uh, light colored uh, substance which may be causing any coloration to the fabric. So, the fabric then becomes quite white and ready to be used for dyeing. Treatment of fabric before dyeing. Now, as we know that in the case of uh, cotton, we also did a treatment of tannic acid. Time and again I am repeating this word because or this sentence because tannic acid treatment is only associated with cotton and right now we are trying to see how cotton fabric is prepared. And as we are going along I am also giving you an insight into the preparation of silk and wool. So, fleetingly I am also mentioning what is necessary for preparation of silk and wool, but primarily we are focusing on the preparation of cotton fabric for dyeing. So, after removing the impurities of fabric, it is then treated with 4 percent weight of the fabric solution of tannic acid in water. The fabric should be dipped in tannic acid solution for at least 4 to 5 hours. It is squeezed and dried. After mordanting, this fabric is used for dyeing and dyeing would depend upon the type of mordanting that has to be subsequently carried on. For our study, only pre-mordanting was carried out, but of course it is possible to do post-mordanting and simultaneous mordanting as well. So, before we go on to the mordanting, let us spend a little more time on the pre-treatment of cotton with tannic acid. This tannic acid could be from the bio sources like one can use myrobalan or one can use uh, terminalia chebula which is myrobalan or one can use curcus infectoria which is gallnut and these two are natural tanning, uh, tannic acid containing uh, bio treatments whereas one can even uh, treat the cotton fabric with tannic acid which has been synthesized in the laboratory. So, whether we use synthetic tannic acid or whether we use isolated uh, tannic acid or whether we use crude gallnut powder or myrobalan powder all give the tannic acid and tannic acid treatment must be done just before the mordanting because it is not advisable to keep the tannic acid treated fabric. It will uh, in due course of time due to air oxidation, it creates a greenish tinge on the fabric. So, the prime reason for using tannic acid is to facilitate the dye uptake for cotton and the second reason for using tannic acid is that it adds adding surfaces onto the fabric which lacks due to desizing and bleaching and all that uh, we the three processes that we just saw that has actually removed the attaching groups from the surface of the fabric and therefore tannic acid treatment provides you know bonding edges for the dye to come and attach. So, that is how the tannic acid plays a very important role and after tannic acid of course, then we have the process of mordanting. We have the choice of mordanting by three different methods pre-mordanting, post-mordanting or simultaneous mordanting and we have studied this time and again. I have been telling about mordanting. Pre-mordanting fabric which is ready treated with tannic acid is now dipped into 4 percent weight of the modern solution not necessarily always 4 percent. We have seen that in the case of copper and chromium modern even 1 to 2 percent is sufficient to provide the desired shape and therefore, we should not dose too much of metal modern onto the fabric only that much percentage should be used which is required for the fabric for the adhesion of the dye. So, after that it is then squeezed and it is dried. You will see that after tannic acid treatment 
or after modern treatment, the fabric is never ever washed. It is simply squeezed and dried. So, what happens? The excess of the tannic acid solution or the excess of the mordant solution just runs off and whatever is adhering to the fabric is what is required. On both the sides, the fabric will have the mordant and the tannic acid and that is what is the requisite amount that should be present on the fabric. No excess is required. Now, one very important innovation that we did in the laboratory was use of sonicator. So, I am just trying to take you through the important features of dyeing. We know conventional dyeing has been practiced for years, but has it made any impact by you know uh, improving the process? Has the industry been benefited? No because conventional dyes do have their own uh, disadvantages. There are dyes where you know the dye gets deteriorated or discolored or there are problems of doing it faster because of the production size and so on and so forth. So, we had developed a process of, of sonicator dyeing with natural dyes. Food dyeing in sonicator has been uh, you know a, a very uh, popularized uh, technique now, lot of industry is interested and uh, there are collaborations happening where we are suggesting the use of big dye baths which have transducers fitted at the bottom and which can be used for sonicator dyeing. Extracted dye is kept in sonicator and treated fabric is dipped in for an hour, maximum to maximum an hour is required. After one hour, it is dried in shade. Dye uptake of the fabric is monitored by the towering or by the lowering of the optical density of the dye bath solution and also by the shade of the color that appears on the fabric. Now, you can make out that what is meant by the shade of the color, the depth of the color because yesterday we did that, that do, uh, because of this color matching machine, we are able to ascertain the LAB values, the K by S values. So, this is what it means and the UV visible spectrophotometer helps us to find out the color depth in the dye bath solution because it is simple phenomena. See, if we make a dye bath of a certain concentration, say X concentration and after dyeing, the dye bath will never have X concentration. It will always have X minus Y concentration. Now, this X minus Y is what has actually gone on to the fabric because the dye cannot disappear anywhere. It has to be either in the dye bath or on the fabric that was dipped. So, this particular uh, phenomena can be analyzed on UV visible spectrophotometer and the color depth and its uh, you know reflectance and transmittance and all that can be found out with the help of K by S which is measured by the color scanning machine. Now, another thing that was observed that when we do modenting, it is stepwise process. That means, first tannic acid treatment, then the fabric is dried, then modenting treatment, fabric is dried and then finally, dyeing. So, it involves three step. Even if we take silk and wool, it is two step. And naturally, when there is multi step procedure offered to the industry, it is always very uh, you know cumbersome it is tedious because any extra step in the dyeing process can actually create waste of money, waste of time, waste of energy. So, if there is a possibility to kind of merge one or two steps, there would be saving of time, saving of cost, saving of energy. So, you see that it is, is going to be advantageous. So, multi step dyeing which was popularly the conventional method of dyeing by going step wise tannic acid 
step, mordanting step, dyeing step, change in dyeing process can result into better dye uptake. In case of biomodants and enzyme, this was observed. So, can we now do some alteration with the metal mordant by replacing it with biomodant or enzyme? Can we merge these processes for the betterment or for the ease for the industry people to follow it? Yes, the answer is that one step dyeing process can be introduced and has been introduced. In one step dyeing process, dyeing is carried out with mordanting that is simultaneous dyeing with the pretreatment. So, pretreated cloth because tannic acid cannot be added into it. So, therefore, after the pretreatment of the tannic acid, the cloth can be simply put into a bath where the mordant and the a dye both are present. So, that would reduce the step and from a multi step dyeing process, it can be brought down to one or a step dyeing. Steps in dyeing, then there are two step dyeing also, that is two step dyeing process. First, mordanting is carried out by enzyme or biomodant or mordant, and then dyeing is done. Both the processes produce different results and sometimes one step dyeing gave very good results. Now, a revived interest in the use of natural dyes in textile coloration has been growing and there is a growing need for the availability of natural dye yielding plants. Thus, there is a strict need to explore our flora and fauna for high dye yielding plants to get new hues and shades in fabric to suit fashion conscience, new age customers demand. So, if we try to look at the whole dyeing process from the industry point of view, always it is a welcoming change that any innovation in the process, if it can reduce three things that is the cost, the energy consumption and the time, then it is a welcoming change and such innovations are most uh, wholeheartedly accepted by the industry. Now, let us try to see why was it necessary to replace metal mordants. We know that all along we have been talking about the eco friendliness of natural dyes. Now, because of the dosing or the using or uh, usage of metal mordants particularly the copper and the chromium metal mordants which are under the category of toxic heavy metals, we had a limitation there and because the effluent still has about 2 to 4 percent of these metal salts after the mordanting uh, of the fabric and it is run out into the uh, river streams or water bodies or even into the agricultural land it has its own ecological impact on this uh, effluent uh, not being able to recover these metal mordants. But at the same time, we know that natural dyes cannot be used without the help of these metal mordants. So, is there a method that we can somehow reduce the quantity of the metal or use a bio mordant which can be a source of metal, but at the same time it has so little the metal component just optimum for the uh, reaction or the dyeing to be sufficient for with this metal mordant present in the bio mordant. Basically, even enzymes of course, have a different role to play, but enzymes somehow participate in a manner which is different from the metal mordant or the bio mordants which are having metal content, but they offer sites of attachment and because they offer sites of attachment of the dyes, when they are applied on the fabric, they offer the dyes to come and sit on that. So, basically enzymes are biological catalysts. The biological means that substances in question is produced or is derived from living, living organism and catalyst denotes a substance 
that has the ability to uh, increase the rate of chemical reaction and is not changed or destroyed by the chemical reaction that it accelerates. Generally speaking, catalysts are specific in nature as to the type of reaction they can catalyze. So, this is the kind of general enunciation of the enzyme, general uh, you know how it is uh, uh, considered, but enzymes as a subclass of catalysts are very specific in nature. Each enzyme can act to catalyze only very selected chemical reactions and only with very selected substance. So, the only drawback with enzymes is that they are very selective and they act more like a catalyst and since they are from the biological origin, their uh, reactivity is kind of just like a lock and key arrangement. Not every key can open every lock. Similarly, not every enzyme is compatible with every dye. So, one has to make a study where dye is sh shown to have a lock and key arrangement with the enzyme. Only then that enzyme will be effective on that particular dye. So, this kind of uh, you know matching has to be made about the compatibility of the dye and the enzyme when we are using enzymes as biomodents. Enzymes nowadays are gaining an increasing role in textile wet processing due to their proven flexibility, reliability and concern about safety, energy and water conservation and environmental responsibility. Enzyme can be used in chemical as well as biochemical processes as they are the most efficient under normal conditions of temperature, pressure and pH. Enzymes are very specific with their action and they show results in reasonably good time and in a very cost effective manner. Enzymes of bio origin thus making the process eco friendly. Why enzymes were accepted? Because they are from the biological origin. So, they are like bio catalyst and therefore, they can be degraded and therefore, they are eco friendly. Types of enzymes that are used in the textile industry, amylases, proteases, lipases, cellulases, beta glucanases or gumase, pectinase, trypsin are the common enzymes with various functions in biological systems and industrial uses and some of which can also be proposed to use as modents in the natural dyeing process. Among those cellulase, protease and trypsins have been taken into study by us and we have shown that these really work very well uh, in with the uh, natural dyeing and the natural dyes. For example, if we try to take example of cellulases, cellulase of various types break down the complex molecule of cellulose into more digestible components of single or multi sugars. Cellulose refers to a group of enzyme which act together and hydrolyze cellulose. Cellulose is a linear polysaccharide of glucose residues connected by beta 1 4 linkages. Like chitin, it is not cross-linked. Native crystalline cellulose is insoluble and occurs as fibers of densely packed hydrogen bonded and hydroglucose chains of 15 to 10,000 glucose units. So, cellulases, cellulases work on cellulose as the name suggests. So, if you remember that much and the structure of cellulose is that it has a 1, 4 linkage of the beta type of various glucose rings which are attached to one another. Its density and complexity make it very resistant to hydrolysis without preliminary chemical or mechanical degradation or swelling. In nature, cellulose is usually associated with other polysaccharides such as xylan and lignin. It is the skeleton basis of plant cell walls. 
cellulase enzyme have gained industrial acceptance for finishing off the cellulosic fiber or fabric to achieve a variety of e effects including enhancement of fabric surface appearance and softening of denim garments without or with low environmental impacts. Enzymatic treatments are usually performed prior or subsequent to dyeing and finishing processes. So, enzymes and the use of enzyme and the use of cellulase particularly has already been there in the textile industry, but for using it for natural dyeing it has been used for the first time by us because it is compatible with cotton. And so, if one has to en enhance the cotton dyeing property, use of cellulase really, really helps us and it helps the dye uptake. Similarly, proteases are a class of enzymes referred to an enzymes whose catalytic function is to hydrolyze or break down protein as the name suggests, proteases. So, protein, they are also called proteolytic enzymes or proteonases. Prote proteases can either break specific peptide bonds or depending on the amino acid sequence of a protein or break down a complete peptide to amino acid that is unlimited or limited proteolases can take place. It can break down to peptide bonds only or it can break down to its most smallest unit that is the amino acid. The activity can be destructive chain abolishing a protein's function or digesting it to its principal components. It can be an activation of a function or it can be a signal in a signaling pathway. However, we are concerned with proteases, how they can work in the dyeing system. The process is called proteolytic cleavage, a common mechanism of activation or inactivation of enzyme, especially involved in blood coagulation and digestion. These are where the protease is used. But when it comes to you know they use a molecule of water and thus they are also classified as hydrolases. Proteases uh, which split up proteins into components of amino acid building blocks, proteolytic enzymes are very important as they break down the peptide bonds in the protein to liberate the amino acids. Additionally, proteolytic enzymes have been used for a long time in various forms of therapy. So, there are hundreds and hundreds of uses of proteases, but what we are concerned or what we are interested in is the use of proteases in the hydrolysis or in the activation or in the biomodenting of wool and silk. Similarly, there is another dry, uh, sorry, another uh, enzyme called trypsin. Trypsin enzyme that acts to degrade protein, it is often referred to as proteolytic enzyme. It is one of the proteases or proteinaceous. Trypsin is one of the three principal digestive proteinases and other being pepsin and chymotrypsin. But we are not concerned mainly with the digestive uh, action of the trypsin. What we are interested that how trypsin cleaves a peptide chain mainly at the carboxyl side of the amino acid and therefore, can it help us in the dyeing process, can it act as a biomodent and that is what is of prime concern. Role of plants as biomodents, a biomodent can be defined as a natural material having one or more metal ion in it which can act as modent. So, either we use metal modent salt directly or use a biomodent source which has metal salt, but in a very small but requisite amount. The special thing about this material is that they are always obtained biologically, that is they may come from vegetative matter. The presence of metal species combines with fabric in the same way as the synthetic metal salt species would do and form the complex with dye to give stability in terms of color fastness to fabric. The research in the field of biomodent is currently going on on fast pace as this could change the picture of dyeing process in a big way. 
if we are able to use biomodants, then the lot of problem that is created by the metal modants can be overcome. Various studies have been done with plants or plant parts as potential biomodants. Two indigenous plants that is Pyrus Pascia and Urea Acuminata which were easily available in the northeast region of India were analyzed for their potential as biomodent. So, two plants have been already identified by us that is Pyrus Pascia and Urea Acuminata and they have been found to have excellent biomodenting capability. Now, this is a picture of Pyrus Pascia and by the analysis of the fruit of this uh, Pyrus Pascia, which is more like you know berries, the, uh, the it was found that copper metal was present and it was analyzed on atomic absorption spectrometer. Similarly, this is a picture of Urea acuminata. The leaves of Urea acuminata have the presence of aluminium and this aluminum also was analyzed through atomic absorption spectroscopy. So, you see that these two plants already have and there may be many more such plants which have metal salts in their fruit or flower or bark or leaves and that those plants can be used as biomodents and completely the metal modenting step can be eliminated. Now, another advantage of using biomodent is that when the dye is being extracted from the plant part of the dye yielding plant, at that point of time only these biomodent yielding plants also can be coheated together. That means they can be boiled together and thus the modenting and the dye extraction or rather the extraction of the mordant and the dye extraction can be done simultaneously. Now, this extract already has the mordant now in the form of bio mordant. So, if the extract is simply concentrated and dyeing is carried out, one full step will be avoided in the dyeing process. Other bio mordants as I said are gallnut that is majufal. Curcus infectoria or Myrobalan, which is Harda, which is also called botanically as Terminalia chebula. It also can be used in place. So, these are Myrobalan and Gallnut have been used from time and again, but nobody actually knows whether they have any metal content or not, but they definitely have tannin content. So, maybe the tannin is contributing. So, they can be also classified as biomodents and of course, we have tannins from various barks of the plants and therefore, it is possible to actually use these tannins very easily for the purpose of dyeing. Now, tannic acid also synthetic tannic acid can be also used at the same time. So, therefore, if we have to then look at various other parameters of dyeing, rate of dyeing, kinetic of dyeing, enthalpy of dyeing, entropy of dyeing, adsorption isotherm, dye affinity, dye uptake, all this can be ascertained. There are procedures available, but it is more from the scientific point of view that these parameters are tested for dyeing. Mm -hmm.